So it's good. Yes. A lot of people have a lot of groups that have built them. Is there a list anywhere of uh, people who have built them? Uh, that's a good question. Should, I should make sure we get to this. Uh, when, when I say then, the things have evolved. We should we've, at least wait to, for the pizza crew to get back to when we're starting. The SRT <laughs> so that um, you don't have to, a minimum amount of things you actually have to build. And, and most of it is you just buy online from Amazon. So, so it has evolved. I mean, if you go back 10 years, it was a lot to do. It wasn't that easy with PC boards and so on. Everything's available commercially. You know, you still have to wire things up and install the software and so And do maybe some mechanical work with the internet and so on. I'll try to, I'll be some something. I don't have a lot of time, so I don't have a lot of But maybe, do I have like 15 or 20 minutes off in my school? As far as I know, nobody has the room after us. So. Well, wait. We'll see. Hello. I didn't know if you wanted to do it inside or outside. Inside. Right over there. I'll go. Yeah, okay, let's give it another couple minutes and then I'll introduce. For those of you online, the reason it's delayed slightly because food just arrived. 
five minutes after the out, like you know, the MIT time. Really? Yeah, well, it's seven. It's seventeen forty-seven currently. I think if anything, it's like add a little bit more time to this IAT, maybe. Yeah, I I mean so. That that sort of a thing. Do you want? I'll give you one. I'll have some of those going like that. I think I'm just going to make a few announcements first, at least, which is um, uh, regarding the series. Of course, there are a couple more lectures this week and then two more next week. So tomorrow, Mary Knapp, also from Haystack, is going to be here to talk about a couple space-based radio astronomy projects. And then on Thursday, Frank Lind is going to be here to talk about radar. Um, then next week, um, we'll have Envia Coster on Space Weather and Joel Dawson, who's going to talk more about 5G technology and cellular. Um, beyond that, if any of you are actually interested in like amateur radio operating or things like that, um, we're having the, well, the club's running the station on green building for the annual um, January VHF contest run by ARL this weekend. Um, you don't need a license to be part of that, as long as other operators there have licenses, because of convenient ways the rules work. Um, and next week on Wednesday, we're actually holding a licensing session for amateur radio licenses from the FCC. If you're interested in that, you should probably spend a couple hours studying, but typically that's more than enough for both MIT students to pass it. And with that, um, I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth in our series of lectures. This one taught by Alan Rogers from MIT's Haystack Observatory on experimental radio astronomy. Dr. Alan Rogers was born in Zimbabwe in 1941, came here to MIT and got his PhD here in electrical engineering in 1967 before joining MIT's Haystack Observatory. Since then, he's made innumerable cont contributions to the radio astronomy community, including, among other things, working on very long baseline interferometry techniques, um, development of holographic imaging for the 37-meter dish at Haystack, work on deuterium line measurements for the interstellar medium in the early 2000s, and also the design and development of the SRTs, or small biophysics students across the country, to learn about radio astronomy. Dr. Rogers is a member of the American Astronomical Society and the American Meteorological Society, as well as the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. And in 2008, he received the Dellinger Gold Medal, and 2010, the Grote Reber Medal for his contributions to radio astronomy. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Alan Rogers. OK, well, I, I'd like to start by thanking you, Daniel, for arranging this. Um, uh, session and I'm sorry that I haven't been able to attend all of the. It's been a pleasure. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about radio astronomy, uh, instrumentation primarily, and just to show you Haystack. This is what Haystack looks like. It, we have a whole new antenna now, and to put it into a larger perspective, uh, this is the facility that MIT and MIT Lincoln Lab have out. Uh, basically, it's 
it's on three towns effectively. Uh, it's on uh, Groton, uh, Westford, and, and Tingsboro. So I'm going to uh, cover, um, I'm going to talk about the radio sky. Um, I'm going to distinguish between uh, what we call continuum in radio astronomy, which is just basically broadband noise, if you will, and spectral line. Spectral line is where there are atoms and molecules that produce resonances that either show up in emission or absorption. Um, I'm going to talk more specifically in that case about the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. I will talk about the small radio telescope, which um, Daniel already mentioned, uh, which is used uh, uh, event horizon telescope, which is an array uh, looking at the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So radio astronomy uh, really started in 1932. Now compared with optical astronomy, of course, it's a very, 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 very new field. Um, and it, it uh, started by uh, Carl Jansky. He was the founder of all radio astronomy. Uh, he was curious about the uh, level of interference um, that was observed uh, with radios. And um, he persisted in, in, make, in making uh, long-term measurements. And he found, uh, much to his surprise, that uh, the periodicity in the strength of the interference um, actually, um, and this is at a relatively low frequency, uh, varies with sidereal time, not with Earth time. In other words, it was definitely coming from the sky and not uh, from, from the Earth. Although back uh, at these low frequencies, of course, uh, uh, automobiles and so on had very, very noisy uh, um, ignitions and so on. But he was able to show that. And um, now moving to uh, uh, the radio sky a little bit, I should like to really point out that uh, there's um, a lot of interference out there. It's not easy to observe, at least at low frequency in, in, in radio astronomy. This is a spectrum um, of the uh, uh, radio sky, if you will, a spectrum if you just go outside with a spectrum analyzer and a small antenna, uh, you'll see all these signals. And in fact, uh, this is back in, two, in the 03, and so I'm sure it's, it's quite a bit worse now. The whole spectrum is getting crowded. There are radio astronomy a uh, actual allocations for radio astronomy. Uh, really the only one which is universal and um, a very important one uh, is the 1400 to 1427 megahertz band. I say very, very important because it's, it is important to radio astronomy, but it also provides a quiet band where other uh, um, technique, other people working with radios can have an environment with, which is relatively quiet. Of course, it's only relatively quiet because uh, all the emissions in, in that frequency range uh, will still come from devices that only meet part 15, which is an FCC requirement for, for various devices. And things like um, fluorescent lamps particularly are very noisy. So uh, the, in that sense, it, it isn't completely protected. Now, radio astronomy, after uh, Carl Jensky got, got it started, um, uh, Grote Reba uh, decided to uh, uh, set up a dish. Um, he set it up at his house. This is back in, in uh, uh, 1944, uh, just before the end of uh, World War II. And he very carefully uh, changed the elevation of the antenna. He, didn't have, he couldn't steer the antenna through, around the whole sky, but he could just tilt the antenna in elevation. And of course, he then used the earth rotation to scan the beam. And he ended up making a map of the radio sky. And what, what he saw basically is that uh, there are some, uh, a band of, of, uh, of continuum uh, that extends in the um, 
Milky Way. And if, if you now look at a modern picture of, of the radio sky, this is now at a higher frequency, 408 megahertz, you can see how the Milky Way uh, uh, really dominates pretty much all the strong sources. There are some uh, strong point sources, Cassiopeia A, for example. Um, and as you look out of the galactic plane, uh, there's relatively little, uh, much weaker signals, although way up the top there, there's, uh, there's a ga another galaxy. Um, I should explain that uh, at 408 megahertz and lower, the, the, radio, the, the radio sky is actually quite bright. Uh, one thing that w you have to appreciate in radio astronomy is that we, we use the, what we call the temperature to signify the strength of the signal. Uh, it's a very convenient thing. So to give you an idea of that, just to give you an idea, um, if you have an antenna that is isotropic, that is, it's, you, you can't actually uh, make one that's completely isotropic, but if you have, had one that was isotropic and you had it inside an enclosure of an absorber at a given temperature, what you'd end up measuring once you calibrated things would be that same temperature. So it's very convenient. So for example, if you have this antenna and uh, you, let's say now you make it more directional and you point it at uh, something that's an absorber that has a given temperature, uh, you'll see that temperature. And a temperature here is, is important because uh, uh, not just the radio astronomy, but particularly these two gentlemen here who were actually primarily interested in, in getting the very lowest noise they could uh, for other reasons, primarily communicate the minimum amount of noise coming from your receiver. And so they did these very careful experiments uh, where they actually looked uh, and calibrated very, very well. And what they ended up finding was that when you look at the sky, um, and this is now at much higher frequencies, um, you, you don't see zero Kelvin. You never get down to zero Kelvin. Down to this number here, which is known as the cosmic microwave background. And it has a spectrum, if you measure the spectrum, that is what you'd expect for um, what we call a thermal source. In other words, it, 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 it has the characteristics of a thermal spectrum. This was a very, very important uh, discovery. Um, and uh, of course, since that discovery, uh, there's been uh, additional work done showing that, yes, the, that 2.7 or roughly 3 Kelvin signal, um, when you image it, uh, you do see that there, there is structure there. But that structure you're looking at up there, uh, taken by Planck, W. Mack, and Kobe, that's a very, very small fraction of the uh, 2.7 uh, Kelvin. I just, I, I, I wasn't quite sure of the audience here. I hope, since you're all MIT and, and I'm sure you do a lot of math and everything. So ju I just want to give you a few formula. I hope uh, you'll bear with me in this and maybe some s simple <laughs> formula. You, you notice that um, uh, Grote Reba, for example, used a, a parabolic dish, which of course is, is, is much like an optical telescope in that, in that respect. So a key question comes up is how accurate does the surface of an antenna have to be in order to be uh, good, to be efficient? And this top um, formula uh, shows that the surface has to, be has to be parabolic to an accuracy that's a small fraction of a wavelength. And you can actually put real numbers into it and uh, you get that top formula there. So typically, if you want a parabolic antenna to work at a wavelength of uh, one meter, for example, it has to be a, have a surface that's good to order a few centimeters, and so on. And so as you go up higher and higher in frequency, the, the, what you need for uh, surface accuracy increases. Another uh, a very interesting, important Formula, simple formula, 
is uh, what is the gain of an antenna uh, in, in, in radio astronomy terms? Um, if, you th if you think of a, a, an isotropic antenna that has a, a beam that's completely isotropic <coughs> throughout four pi radians, uh, let's call that, we, we call that an antenna gain of one. That's our, our reference, if you will. So as you increase the area of a, a dish, and, and this, is, this formula really is uh, appropriate primarily for, uh, for uh, a, a, a dish antenna, not, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about other antennas that are not dishes a little bit later. Uh, this is a very relatively simple formula, the gain that you'd expect, assuming uh, that it has a good surface. If it doesn't, then you have to uh, take into account the roughness of the surface. Um, so it depends on, on the area uh, as a fraction of a ratio to the weight. <coughs> so if you want an antenna to have very high gain, you, you, need, to, um, you need to have a, a, lot of, a lot of area to it. Um, this is another formula which is, is very useful, and that is if you think, I mentioned that when you point uh, an antenna, uh, to a, an object that has a given temperature and that object is an absorber, you measure that temperature. But what if you point an antenna through a medium which uh, absorbs some of that radiation um, and, and, ha and, and, and you now have a background behind that, um, what happens is that you basically uh, obeys the laws of thermodynamics. So. For, for example, if we define what we call the opacity of the medium, uh, if the media was very, very thick, had a very high opacity, you just would measure the, the temperature of, of, of the... Um, th this, this would dominate. You would measure the temperature of that media, and, this, and if you think of the sky as being something beyond that, that would be attenuated. Uh, that's an important, uh, uh, an important relationship when you come to look at spectral lines, which I'm going to talk about. There's a few more uh, formulas, maybe some, a little bit of... Uh, uh, so I didn't mention earlier that the, a rough estimate of the beam width of an antenna is just the wavelength divided by the diameter. Um, and uh, this is the formula here for the efficiency. Now, when you use a radio astronomy cal uh, antenna, you like to calibrate that antenna. And so uh, the way to calibrate an, a radio astronomy antenna is to, with this very, very simple setup here, so what you do is you take that antenna and you point it up at the sky. So hopefully, you know, this is, would be only relevant for an antenna that has a beam uh, or, or, um, that doesn't illuminate a significant fraction of the ground. In other words, it's mostly looking at the sky. Um, what you do is you put um, an absorber over the, the antenna. In this case, for a, a parabolic antenna, you probably just put it over the, over the feed, what we call the feed. You know, if you have a satellite TV dish, for example, I, you know what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm talking about the feed itself. So now what you do is you measure the, what we call the Y factor. You measure the power that you observe from, from the receiver, or in this case from the, from the amplifier, uh, low noise amplifier, and follow that by the spectrum analyzer. You measure that uh, ratio between the power you measure looking at the sky compared with what you see when you're looking at the absorber. And then you, you, you get this uh, uh, Y factor. You can, once you've got that, then you can invert that in order to calculate with what we call the system temperature uh, of, your, of your system. So emphasize again, a simple way of calibrating in radio astronomy is basically to to put an absorber in front of the antenna. In the case, for example, in a small radio telescope I'm showing here, what you'd end up doing is either putting something in front of the antenna feed itself or pointing the antenna 
at, for example, at the trees, which act as a pretty good absorber, and comparing the signal strength you get looking at the trees compared with the signal strength that you get uh, looking at the, at the sky. Of course, to do the calculation properly, you have to assume that the sky is not zero degrees. It's at least uh, three, roughly three Kelvin. Um, what I'm showing you here is now, I'm moving really now towards spectral line. Um, this is um, a map of the sky taken with a small radio telescope. And what we're looking at here is, is not the broadband noise from the sky. We're looking at a signal from the hydrogen atom itself at a frequency of uh, 1,420 megahertz. And what, what I illustrate here with the different colors are that the uh, frequency that you observe, and I'll be showing you some plots, um, changes depending on uh, where you're looking. Uh, this is the uh, uh, coordinate system where this is the galactic plane, if you will, or the Milky Way, and the, these are the north and south poles. This is a region of the sky that you can't observe. This is what you, uh, this is the visible sky here uh, at, our, uh, at our latitude. And you can see that over here, for example, the red show shows that the frequency has been Doppler shifted down to a lower frequency, whereas over here uh, with the blue, um, it, the frequency is shifted higher. And that means, of course, that here the gas is moving towards you, uh, and here it's moving away from you. Uh, here's a, a pic another picture of a radio telescope, the other one I uh, the previous one I showed was actually uh, uh, a, a radio telescope that we had on a trailer and actually uh, several years ago it was actually brought down here to MIT. This is a, a, another example of a small radio telescope. This is at the uh, University of Michigan. Um, and uh, really just showing this to show you that it, it, you know, what it looks like on the roof of the, it's a very nice facility because Unlike many universities and, and places that have a small radio telescope, uh, they end up putting it on the roof, but then unfortunately nobody can go onto the roof because it's not well protected, there are safety issues. So this is what a, a spectrum of the um, looks at with, looks like when you look at the, the uh, the sky uh, at a, in a particular direction. This is looking at a direction of galactic uh, B, a block diagram of the current uh, small radio telescope design. Um, it, it has a, a B. I'll be showing you some, some pictures as well, but just to give you an idea to start with um, of the overall block diagram. So you have a B. Um, which of course is, this is a parabolic system, so this is going to be the feed that illuminates the end, the, the uh, parabolic dish. And these are commercial components. This is a low noise amplifier, another low noise amplifier filter. These can be purchased from a company <coughs> called Mini Circus. Um, this system is made so that these devices need uh, a DC voltage and we use what we call a bias T so we can effectively just have a single cable uh, to bring the both bring the, our radio frequency signal down and to, and to take the DC signal up to power these units. And then the, there's some post amplification and um, down here we, we eventually end up with uh, a device which is we call the TV dongle, which is a USB device that's actually designed for watching television in the, in the in Europe. It's not compatible with US television, um, and it's if you look at the numbers here, you see <coughs> and you, this device, the uh, uh, the TV dongle is is a ten dollar device from from Amazon. Um, so just to give you an idea, if anybody's interested in building one, uh, if you add all of this up and include um, the pieces in order to motor drives and everything in order to point the antenna, uh, 
you come up with about $2,000. If you're happy with a system like the one that Grove Reba had, and you, all you're going to do is to point the antenna at a fixed <coughs> elevation and just change that elevation by hand each day, you don't need these two pieces, and you can make, probably make the antenna for you know, a few hundred dollars. So make the SRT for a few hundred dollars. What's that VBF block? Um, sorry, were you asking the about the right hand corner of the VBF 1445? The, the, these are these are filters. There's some filtering needed. Um, I mentioned that the in the upper right corner. Yeah, that, that's a that's a, a bandpass filter that's available from uh, mini circuits. Um, it's, a, it's centered at, at 1445. You actually have to look up the part number to get the, the, the detailed bandwidth and everything, but it, it, it nicely covers the, the hydrogen line frequency. So some filtering is needed because um, while the frequency range from 1400 to 1427 is protected, uh, there's a lot of very, very strong signals on the edges of that band, and so you do need to have a reasonably uh, designed system so that you don't end up, for example, saturating. If this filter went here, you, you, you would end up getting too much signal from, from uh, other things that are outside of the radio astronomy band that would end up saturating this amplifier. So you do need the filtering. Uh, this shows you the, the, the feed, which in this case is, is done using a helix. Um, that actually gives you circular polarization. But the hydrogen line is not actually um, polarized. It's unpolarized, so uh, this is actually a good match for, for looking at the hydrogen line. That uh, helix is placed inside of a, uh, a cake pan, which is basically used to, to form, if you will, a, a cavity behind that. And this is a picture I mentioned, the TV dongle. Um, the beauty of this particular device is that it, it actually contains effectively a complete receiver. It has um, some RF filtering. Um, it has a built-in synthesizer and uh, analog to digital conversion. Uh, this is this is a, a picture. There are quite a few different varieties of these. Um, um, this is actually a little bit uh, older one, but um, all of these. In fact, there's a big community out there uh, building software to find radios, and they're typically using uh, these TV dongle devices. Uh, this is just showing uh, that um, uh, one of the big uses for the small radio telescope is to look at and measure the galactic rotation <coughs> curve. Oh, excuse me. So I'm, I showed you this uh, picture before, the spectrum. Um, it turns out if you measure this point here, um, you can actually uh, look at a diagram like this and, and use the data that you get um, at that edge of the spectrum in order to, uh, with quite a fair amount of math involved, to compute a, a curve which shows how that um, uh, frequency, <coughs> which could, you convert to a velocity, um, varies as a function of the distance from the center of the galaxy. And of course, that distance you change by changing the uh, pointing of the antenna. And what you would expect is if all the mass of the galaxy were at the center of the galaxy, then you'd expect to have a balance between the gravitational force and the centrifugal force, in which case you'd expect this velocity to drop off with 1 over the square root of the distance away from the center of the galaxy. And this, was a, this type of measurement has also been done optically. And probably most of you have heard of Vera Rubin, who recently passed away a couple of years ago now. Uh, she made a lot of measurements of galactic rotation curves of a lot of different galaxies. And, um, uh, and, and she has this nice plot I'm showing of hers where, you know, this is what you'd expect, and uh, this is what you end up getting. So the explanation is that 
we're not seeing all the mass. There's more mass there that's uh, what we call dark matter. Now I'd like to just talk, try to explain the spectral line a little bit more. I've already talked about the, the hydrogen line. The hydrogen line is a frequency of 1420 megahertz. Um, you can think of the hydrogen line, it's, been, it's formed um, by the interaction of the spin of the um, nucleus and the, the spin of the proton, the spin of the electron. If you think of it as two little magnets, uh, there's an energy difference between whether the magnets are aligned or anti-aligned. You know, if you take two little magnets and you, you put them like that, they'll want, to, uh, they'll want to go to where the north and south pole um, uh, are agree with each other. Um, and that energy difference uh, equals 1420 megahertz. Um, there are, of course, lots of other spectral lines uh, that are used in radio astronomy. I'm just showing a few examples here. Uh, this is, um, these are spectra from the OH molecule, which uh, uh, I was um, fortunate enough to be around when, when the OH line was discovered by my thesis advisor and actually helped in some observations. Uh, and also, um, there are spectral lines which are due to isotopes, which are very interesting spectral lines because they tell us something about the physics of what's going on in the actual formation uh, of the um, uh, galactic uh, clouds and media. Um, uh, this actually shows you all the different energy levels that are, are involved in, uh, uh, in the different spectral lines. Um, this was an exciting uh, discovery. Uh, uh, when I was working with, with, with the OH line with my, my thesis advisor, we were only looking at the absorption lines of the um, OH. In that case, we were looking at these lines which are dips. And the reason they dip is because, we, as I explained with that uh, formula I showed, is that we had a bright background from, from a star, for example, like Cassiopeia A, has a bright signal, radio signal. And so what the, the OH molecules do in that case is they absorb some of that signal, so we see a dip in the signal. Uh, it was discovered that there were, in fact, regions of the sky when, where these uh, lines were, were not in absorption. They were, very, they were actually very strong. And in emission, and in fact, when these were first discovered, um, there was some question about maybe these are signals from, you know, from, from intelligent civilizations out there. But it turns out that these signals are due to a, a pumping mechanism where uh, molecules get excited up to higher energy levels and end up uh, causing an inversion of the population. By inversion of the population, I mean the uh, more of these molecules in the higher energy state than in the low energy state. Um, watching the time a little bit here, because I'm trying to cover a lot of material, but uh, I'd now like to talk about the um, uh, deuterium line. Um, when the, the, th if the theory of, of the universe uh, with the Big Bang is that these are the uh, are basically formed during the Big Bang. Effectively, um, virtually all of what was formed in the Big Bang is, is hydrogen. About 25% of that is, is helium. And then you have much smaller amounts of, uh, for example, deuterium. Um, and so in, in radio astronomy, it was very important to try to determine how much deuterium uh, is out there relative to the hydrogen. Could we, could we uh, actually measure that and see if it agrees with the, with the theory of, of the uh, creation of the universe? We're, we're, we're actually, all of us here, all the more complicated um, atoms are all the result of what goes on in stars. So this is what you have just before any stars form. The only thing, 
of those atoms right there. So in order to, to uh, measure the deuterium line, what we ended up doing was building a large array of antennas. And the reason for building this large array is that the deuterium is, line is very, very weak. And the, it, it's very weak because the amount of deuterium compared with the amount of sort of parts per million is very, very weak because of its, it's very highly diluted compared to the, uh, the hydrogen. So what we ended up doing was building uh, a system with many, many antennas. Now, I want to emphasize right now that this is, we're not used, this is not an interferometer in the sense that we're, we're correlating the data between uh, what we call stations here. Uh, we're just using a lot of antennas so that we can get a reasonable signal to noise ratio. So if you have um, a, uh, many antennas and you have a weak signal, then you can uh, improve your chances of seeing a weak signal uh, and lower the, the, increase the signal to noise ratio by, by adding uh, these additional antennas. Um, if we hadn't done this, in theory, it would have taken us literally centuries to get enough data to, uh, to uh, detect the deuterium line. Uh, this a little bit more detail now. Um, I want to. Sh I'm, I mentioned originally that you know, antennas are not always parabolic antennas. Uh, at low frequencies, uh, for example, here with with the deuterium, we ended up using this is effectively a dipole. Although actually, if you include the directors up there, you might. They're actually Yagi antennas, effectively. Uh, and the reason for adding the director, making them Yagi is that that re actually reduces the amount of um, antenna gain at the horizon, which is very important in radio astronomy because most of the interference, if you will, in radio astronomy comes from low elevation. Um, so <coughs> having a, and also, of course, the, uh, the noise, if you will, that's produced by the uh, radiation from those trees, because they're not at zero, zero Kelvin, um, is, is produced by having an antenna whose gain drops off at the horizon. By the way, the direct, are the directors, those are the bottom things, right? No. Uh, th these are, th this is the main dipole, and it's, we have a cross dipole, because oh. we're actually using two polarizations. Uh, these are the directors up here, and this is a ground screen. So the directors reduce the... They help. They help reduce the the level at the horizon. Yes. Yes. Is the air, is the airstream trailer metal to like prevent EMI, or is that just? A, uh, no, the airstream trailer over here is we, on the airstream trailer. We have uh, a, a, a set of Yagi antennas looking at different directions. This is entirely for RFI monitoring purposes, uh, and doesn't really. Uh, well, it was important in in. In, in this experiment because when we first uh, started uh, the experiment, we had a lot of trouble with interference. And we had to spend a lot of time, for example, I would, I would determine where the interference was coming from by, by first looking at the results from, from these uh, yogis in different directions. Then I'd, I'd go out with a handheld system and walk along until I could get the stronger and stronger signal. Eventually, I would end up at somebody's house and then I would knock on the door, and I, I would say, I'm getting interference at, uh, from, from something in your house. And, uh, and the lady who would answer the door said, well, you know, I, I, could you, do you have any idea where it is? She'd let me come in. And then we found out, for example, that the interference was coming from, from an old fax machine. And she said, I haven't had that, used that for years. I don't, so she just unplugged it, so you know that was gone away. <laughs> in another case, I'd go to somebody's house and I'd find that the interference was coming from some uh, some game. I forget the name of the game now because this was many years ago, and I'm getting up in years. I don't remember things very well. But anyway, it turned out that there was there was interference at 327, and actually in this particular case, we ended up uh, uh, getting a little modification made to the hardware in order to, 
this young fellow could actually run his game without causing interference. But we spent a lot of time tracking down interference. How far away were those sources of RFI? Uh, well, well, the ones that we took care of typically were within, I would say, two miles or so of the, of the array. Yes, things further away than that, um, we, didn't, we couldn't do much about. But I'll show you in a moment, we got very good spectra. Just to give you some detail, um, the, the low noise amplifier, this is, we're looking into one of these dipoles. The low noise amplifier is right here and is connected directly uh, to the antenna uh, elements. Um, I, I should emphasize here that we actually, um, the, each element of the antenna here actually uh, was a shorted um, transmission line and basically that gave us a way of, of additional filtering. Uh, as I emphasize again, even though the 327 megahertz band is relatively clear of interference, um, uh, there's lots of other strong signals around that will cause saturation effects in your, in your receiver. And so we, in this case, in order to reduce the intermodulation uh, that results in the preamp, we actually have to include some filtering right in the antenna itself before going into the low noise amplifier. This shows uh, inside one of these receivers, there are multiple down conversions. It's a 48 channel receiver uh, with uh, two, two computers to, uh, to take continuous data. Um, we actually, because each one of those, what we call stations, was actually a four by four array, if you will. We could actually steer the beam of the overall station, and this just shows what the, uh, the beam looks like. Um, and uh, this shows uh, how far away from the zenith the beam, of course, is uh, when we phase all the antennas, the elements together, uh, to to look at the, the zenith, as we, we can steer away up to an angle here of about 30 degrees, and you can see we start to lose a substantial amount of sensitivity. So basically with this system, we could steer the beam of about 30 degrees or so. These are the results we obtained. Um, and um, I should just emphasize that the equivalent integration time that, for example, goes into measurement like this is about um, uh, 15 years. Um, we could not have done this experiment, um, which we ended up doing in about a year or so, uh, without having multiple stations. It is a very, very weak signal. Uh, the signal strength here, uh, it, it's over here in terms of uh, strength in parts per million, and over on the other side in strengths of Milli Kelvin, thousands of a Kelvin. So this is uh, extremely good. And I emphasize again that the noise you get, which are based at Gaussian statistics, uh, is, will drop off with the square root of the number of stations you have, as well, of course, being dependent <coughs> on the integration time and the bandwidth. So now I want to. Um, uh, talk a little bit about the surprising result. Um, uh, this is a, a <coughs> spectrum of the sky uh, at now relatively low frequencies. This is between 50 and 100 megahertz. And you see the sky noise is very high at, in this frequency range. It's thousands of degrees. It also has this uh, curve to it. It's, it gets higher and higher as you go lower in frequency. We ended up measuring a, an absorption, which you can see here. This is basically derived by subtracting from that top curve a low order polynomial. So what we're doing, and then expanding the scale. So this is what we see. Um, and this, as I explained, is, is unexpected. Um, this is, uh, we measured about a, a dip there of um, half a Kelvin. This is what it was actually predicted by the current models, something that's much, much weaker than what we observe. Uh, this is another illustration of, of uh, 
the signal which we observe compared with what is expected from current model. Uh, there's a lot to explain here, so I'm not sure I have enough, enough time. Uh, I've got several different scales here. I have a scale of frequency. I have a scale in terms of redshift. I have a little illustration here of what actually forms the hydrogen line. That is, it's due to this uh, uh, spin uh, uh, flip transition. Um, how do you get a strong absorption? To get a strong absorption, what you need to do is to have most of those hydrogen atoms in the low energy state. Because the more you have in the low energy state, the stronger the absorption. So how do you do that? Um, well, one possible way of doing that is to have the hydrogen um, uh, temperature, the actual physical kinetic temperature, drop down much lower than as expected. So this is a, um, if you will, an illustration that I tweaked to show how that might happen. The actual model, uh, current models show that the, you know, this is a cosmic microwave background. This is, you have to realize that the cosmic microwave background is, we measure it today as three Kelvin, but when you look at it as a function of, of high redshift, um, it has a higher value. Um, so this is the cosmic microwave, microwave background, and this is what the kinetic temperature does. If that kinetic temperature dropped much lower than expected, um, so it's, if it got down well below 3 Kelvin, um, uh, you'd expect a stronger absorption. I just summarized some of the results here. Um, let me move along. Uh, I want to show you a little bit about the actual hardware. The experiment was done in Western Australia. Um, and the antenna is very simple. It's, it's a planar dipole antenna. We actually had two of them, one covering 50 to uh, the, the low band one, covering 50 to 100 megahertz, and the high band one going from 100 to 200 megahertz. Uh, the electronics itself, uh, illustrated here was below the antenna um, and the back end, the computer and so on, were in this, in this hut, which you can see up there in the picture. Why Australia? Uh, uh, Australia because this is a relatively unpopulated area and a relatively low level of interference. I'll, I'll show you a bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, this is a block diagram. And uh, looking at the time, I don't, I don't have enough time to really get into a lot of detail. But basically, to, to make this kind of measurement, it has to be, things have to be very, very well calibrated. And you have to take into account, for example, the loss in, the, in what we call, the, in this case, the Balin, which is a conversion from, from balanced to unbalanced, which is like a small uh, length of the transmission line, although this is what our Bailey transmission line looks like. Um, we have to account for um, the uh, LNA um, noise performance, and in order to do all of this, we used a switching scheme where we switch between looking at the antenna and we, we switch between looking at a um, a straight attenuator, and then a third position where we look at, and we add a noise source as well. And we also have to do uh, calibration in the lab. Um, this is a, uh, another thing we had to do. We had to have a large ground plane. And uh, the reason uh, that we have to have a large ground plane is that we have, we have some ripples, these ripples in the spectrum, which show up when the, when the galaxy is overhead. Um, and we have to account, we have to compensate for those. And the larger the ground plane, the smaller these, and, the, and the, that more easily we can compensate for them. Um, there were some considerable technical innovations to do this. We had to be able to um, measure the reflection coefficient of the antenna extremely accurately. Um, this is because 
any, any antenna system is not going to be a perfect match to the low noise amplifier, and so you have to account for the amount of signal that is reflected back uh, very accurately, and we came up with a method of improving the accuracy of a vector network analyzer. Those of you who use vector network analyzers are probably familiar with getting an uh, open and short uh, load uh, from, the, uh, from the manufacturer, pre-measured pre if you will. We came up with a scheme where we could actually take the subject published here. Um, I don't really have enough time to go into a lot of detail here either, uh, but I want to also just on emphasize that we also have to uh, um, correct for the noise that's produced by the LNA itself. And there's two types of noise produced by the LNA, one which is uh, uncorrelated and another component which is correlated. And uh, in order to do that, we have to do a calibration process in the lab. So in the lab, uh, we have to measure the S11 reflection coefficient of the LNA, and we also have to use hot and ambient loads to calibrate. Um, and uh, we use an open and shorted cable in order to calibrate those noise waves. And we measure these three position uh, spectra, and then all of this uh, done in the lab, so this is uh, this is important. And uh, when we first detected this signal, one of the or we were in, close to being confident of something, and I gave I gave a short talk. Uh, one of the comments that came up a reason immediately: Well, have you taken your receiver back to the lab, recalibrated, and make sure you get the same result? Yes, we we did that, but. That was um, an important question. So in the field, um, we also have to uh, measure the antenna reflection coefficient because unfortunately that isn't necessarily very stable. It may change with time, particularly uh, in terms of um, you know, if somebody's walking on the ground plane and so on, there can be changes. So we had the system uh, <coughs> set up so that we can measure the reflection coefficient in the field. Um, this is just to show that not only can we use this system to measure the uh, spectral line, but we can also use it to measure the, this, how the sky noise varies as a function of um, uh, local sidereal time. And it turns out that the measurements that we've been able to, to make with this have ended up improving what's known as the global sky model. And we're now getting pretty, pretty good agreement with the, with the system. Uh, you may, I mentioned uh, Western Australia. This is a, uh, a map of uh, the interference level on the US. Uh, this is obtained from a, an MIT grad who um, started this uh, company, Radio Rocator. Okay. I don't am sure if that's still, uh, still active, but we got what he did for us, he provided us with a integrated strength of the FM radio signals for the entire country based on a, a propagation models and based on the FCC database. And what we found from that, <coughs> well, the National Radio Quiet Zone is not very quiet. In fact, for testing, we used a site up at West Forks, which is a little quieter than the National uh, Radio Quiet Zone. Uh, there is a, a site here that uh, we visited in 2009, and we were, one of our group was there yesterday and, and today uh, making measurements. And we, we, we feel this site here, it's in the Catlow Valley in Oregon, is probably just as quiet as the site in Western Australia. So we are planning within the next uh, six months or so to deploy a system at that location. Um, this is uh, another um, instrument that is relatively easy to construct and, and useful for demonstrating and uh, teaching radio astronomy techniques. Uh, this is um, something which we call a very small radio. 
telescope and what it is is to take two satellite TV dishes and basically use this as an interferometer. So this is a, a, a single baseline interferometer, just two. And we use a computer system. Uh, in this case, um, we, we don't actually use a TV dongle. We could. We haven't. Uh, uh, we just take the two signals and we add those signals together. And because these TV, uh, uh, what are they? These are known as low noise block feeds. They have free running local oscillators. It turns out that there's always going to be a frequency difference between the two uh, antennas. And what that does when you add the two signals together, it produces a beat tone. And so, device uh, that is a uh, uh, computer, uh, it's a device time I have. So, do you still got like 20? Okay, good, all right, good. very good, thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna move along a little bit more. I, I have mentioned interferometry. Uh, uh, the simplest interferometer that you can build is the one I just showed where you just take the two signals from two antennas and add them together. In fact, the very first radio astronomy interferometer was done by taking a single antenna and going out to a location uh, just above the ocean. And basically then what you do is you get the signal from the star in the sky, and you also get the signal from the, 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 the star in the sky or the radio source in the sky reflected off the water. And of course, since they're coming to the same antenna, they're effectively added together. And so even with a single dish, you could see the effects like, for example, the Cassiopeia A source that I showed in the slide. Um, this is a setup that has become very important in recent years, and it's what we call very long baseline interferometry. So if you try to build an interferometer with a very long baseline, <coughs> the problem is you've got to have a way of getting the signal from one antenna to the other. And so what you end up doing is actually just recording the signals along and use a clock so that you know precisely the time of the individual samples. And then, of course, you can mail those to, uh, in this case, this, was, this drawing was made about 20 years ago now, and the signals were, were tapes were, were mailed back, and then we processed the data by uh, correlation in, in a computer system. So one, one of the things that we started doing with very long baseline interferometry was uh, making very precise measurements of the Earth. And to do that, we would look at distant uh, radio sources from, typically from quasars. These are very distant galaxies that have a strong radio source at their center, probably due to a black hole. And measuring this, um, time difference of arrival of the signals. And using this system, um, uh, you can actually measure very accurately uh, the position of the radio source in the sky, and you can also measure very accurately the distance between the antennas. Um, but of course, in order to throw out uh, as the Earth rotates, and you have to observe a number of radio sources to do that. So uh, this was a technique that uh, really started off uh, actually also not only for measuring Earth um, parameters, but also um, looking at objects in the sky with very high resolution, which I'll describe in a minute. Uh, the, um, one of the first time, uh, you can see the change here of the order of and, well, right there, two centimeters per year movement. And if you look at the whole globe, uh, plate motions here um, have been measured between different, many different plates. Um, now I want to just uh, move to the other thing that VLBI can do. Uh, as I say, it, I think most of the VLBI in the early days 
tended to concentrate on, on, the, on the geodesy measurements um, because they were very important and also <coughs> probably primarily because they were really funded by other agencies other than uh, astronomy. So, uh, what, how does an interferometer really work? Well, I, I think I've explained a little bit that you know to build an interferometer, you really only need two antennas. Um, however, uh, if you just have two antennas, um, you only had a, you 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 do get a, a single baseline, and that baseline does change as the Earth rotates. If you're thinking of using that single baseline antenna, single Earth baseline antenna to measure something in the sky as the Earth rotates, that projected baseline uh, makes an elliptical shape in the sky, and so you do get what we call a. Uh, coverage in the what we call a UV plane. And this is showing the various baselines that get formed uh, due to the Earth rotation, which is important. And that is um, when you do VLBI, um, it actually is very hard to get any phase information because uh, you have to have such extremely precision knowledge of your timing to do that. But it turns out that if you have three antennas, you can make what we call closure measurements. In other words, with three antennas, you've got three baselines. You can measure three phases. And it turns out that the algebraic sum of those baseline, uh, of those phases is actually independent of the um, clocks. It depends only on the structure, so we can we get what we call measurement of a closure phase, which is a very useful parameter for imaging. Uh, this is some early results from from imaging. Uh, in this case, imaging uh, quasars, uh, showing that um, uh, quasars are actually uh, are changing. You can you can see. Uh, and I should probably have had a movie here, where movies now have been made showing that you can actually see the, the jet actually move with time. Uh, the most important uh, current um, system is um, known as the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, probably many of you already heard about this. Um, I'm not going to say a huge amount about it. There's plenty on the web, and I'm sure uh, you'll be hearing a lot about it in the coming years. It's, it's a large group of people. Uh, there are a lot of um, and papers, I believe, will be start, starting to come out very soon. Uh, this is just to show you from some early measurements um, that um, w when we look at this object, Sagittarius A, that is basically the radio source that's at the center of our galaxy. Um, we can, um, using in this case, just looking at a single baseline, um, so you know, we, can, we can show see how the correlated signal depends on the baseline length. And from that, we can estimate the size of the radio source at the center of our galaxy. And, uh, and the size we get uh, there is about 43 micro arc seconds. So you, it, if you have a single antenna, the resolution you get is basically the wavelength divided by the diameter. With an interferometer, the resolution you get is the wavelength divided by the baseline length. So when you go and build an interferometer that has antennas that are around the globe and you've got about 7,000 kilometers of baseline, and you've got a frequency up um, in the 100 gigahertz range, you have resolution of micro arc seconds. And this is a far higher resolution than you can get from any other technique, uh, from optical. Or, and in principle, maybe you could build a long baseline optical interferometer, but that has not yet been done. So with, with the radio technique, you can get this really incredible uh, angular resolution. And the goal of the Event Horizon Telescope 
uh, is to actually make images. And now they have, and I don't have a diagram to show you because I, I cut back my slides. <laughs> I, I think I'm running out of time. So um, they have many sites now. They have uh, sites at the South Pole. They have uh, sites in Europe, sites here in the US. Uh, so they've got, and most importantly, they've got um, a site in, in uh, South America, Chile, the, the new uh, array of antennas there that has a large number of antennas that gives the, the whole system greater sensitivity. When you have an interferometer and you have antennas that are <coughs> of different sizes, the, the strength of this correlated signal you get is basically the square root of the product of those two. So if you have one very large antenna in, a, in an array, uh, that really helps the sensitivity uh, for all the baselines that you get between uh, the smaller antennas. So that one large antenna can be used to enhance the sensitivity of the whole array. And that's really what has been done with the EHT, using the ALMA array to boost the sensitivity to the point where they're expecting to get um, really good images and, and hopefully movies also of what's happening at the center of our galaxy. I think I'm ready for questions, and I so, hope I left enough time. So um, let's see. Anybody? Did I, I hope I answered the, I was, we had some discussion earlier about calibration, and I tried to explain that uh, to calibrate, um, we use typically hot and cold devices. So for example, to calibrate a small radio telescope, you would take that radio telescope and you look at the, the signal power you get out, looking at the sky and put an absorber in front, look at that signal and, and get what we call a Y factor. Um, you, you can, uh, and that same technique um, is, is pretty widely used. You can also do the following, if you have a, a system like the deuterium array, where you're not interested really in measuring the sky itself, you're interested in measuring the deuterium, so now you, you just want good calibration for the deuterium. What you can do is you can take a model of the sky, which is being measured by other systems which measure the continuum strength of the sky, and use that signal in order to uh, calibrate your, um, your spectral line system. And that's what we did with the deuterium array, was to use the sky itself as a means of calibration. Now, the reason the sky of itself works quite well is that the signal from the sky is not, is not constant as a function of, as the Earth rotates, for example, when the, when the uh, Milky Way is below the horizon, you have a relatively weak signal from the sky. When the Milky Way is up, you have a much stronger signal. And so that gives you a power ratio that you compare with the power ratio that you're going to get out of your receiver. Yes? Uh, so sometimes there are, are uh, storms in the, in the ionosphere, like they just drop a GPS, and like their propagation of, of GPS. Uh, do like ionospheric storms affect uh, these kind of measurements? Or? Well, typically, the, uh, the effect of the ionosphere drops off inversely as the wavelength squared. Mm -hmm. um, so that as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, the ionosphere becomes, you know, becomes negligible. Okay. The answer, for example, in geodesy, uh, in order to make those very <coughs> accurate measurements um, uh, of baseline lengths, we do actually have to observe at two, at least two widely separated frequencies in order to compensate for the effects of the ionosphere on that delay I was talking about. As you go down, it, it, once you drop below a frequency of about uh, 50 megahertz, mm -hmm. the ionosphere effects become very large. And in fact, uh, if you want to do radio astronomy observations down as low as 20 megahertz, as Grote-Reber did back in the, um, uh, well, this was later. It wasn't his first. This was in the 60s and 70s. Uh, he went to a, 
uh, a site in Tasmania where the effects of the ionosphere are kind of minimized, it just happens at that elevate, at that latitude. And because he wanted to get lower in frequency. And ultimately, if you really want good results at very low frequencies, you're going to have to go into space. And to get away from the effects of RFI and so on, you're going to have to go to the far side of the moon to block the signals that are coming from Earth. Yes? The experiment that you were involved in when you were chasing down the lady's fax machine, what was the reason for choosing those simple uh, dipole like Yogi's that you used it, like the synthetic, rather than dishes? Is it okay. precision or dishes would be less effective? Well, let me explain. Firstly, when we're looking at the hydrogen line, it's relatively, it's, 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 it has broad structure. It, let, let me explain it this way. If, if you have a radio telescope and you, um, you look, for example, at the, at the moon, um, then you know the bigger the aperture you get, the stronger and stronger signal you're going to get until the beam width that you get gets smaller than the moon itself. And then as the antenna gets bigger and bigger, you don't get a stronger signal. And so when you're looking at the um, hydrogen, for example, uh, or the deuterium, it's relatively spread out. So there's, there's no advantage then in having a beam width that's smaller, than, much smaller than that size. Uh, in terms of the signal to noise, in, noise you'd get, uh, you know, we had to have a large number of antennas and we had to integrate for a long time. If we'd done it with bigger antennas, it wouldn't have made the, we'd, we'd have to have as many antennas and we'd still have to observe the same amount of time. It wouldn't help us. It would only help us if we were trying to, to resolve, in some sense, the structure of the deuterium. I hope that explains. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yes. Well, many years ago, um, I did my thesis with um, Chuck Councilman. Um, it was um, differential interferometry that he was doing, using uh, looking at the LSEP, the Apollo transmitter packages that were on the surface of the moon. Right. Um, and looking at signals from um, those different packages at different locations on the moon, and then observing those at different locations on the Earth. Right. And one of the things that um, we talked about at that time was the idea that because this was differential, yes. that um, effects that were common to a pair of these mm -hmm. would tend to cancel out. Yes. So right. for example, ionospheric um, disturbances, which um, might affect conditions between the sites on the Earth and the sites on the Moon in the same way, um, in this measurement would tend to right. Um, cancel out. Yes. I don't know how useful that. What it is. I think there's many experiments where that di yeah. the differentials are, are very useful. Uh, for example, you know, in in, in regular uh, regular interferometer arrays like the the VLA, for example, uh, ALMA, uh, in order to get uh, very accurate uh, positions of, 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 of objects in the sky, uh, typically what would be done would be to observe one you know, strong object of known position and a weaker objects and, and look at the differential measurements in order to get a, a good, accurate position for the other objects that you're, you're observing. And in that case, yes, if the angle of separation is small, atmospheric and ionospheric effects do cancel out. And that is a, a used to an advantage in many, many cases. Okay. Any others? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, getting back to that same antenna where you're looking at, um, um, so I guess what you're looking at, isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium. And you mentioned, I understand you didn't bother to use a reflector, but I'm surprised why not just put a shield around it, like a high fence or something. Well, we, 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 we looked antenna. at that. We absolutely looked at, 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 and we did a lot of modeling of, of using a high fence. And it turns out, though, it's not as easy as that. That fence actually has to be very high. There, because the wavelength is not that short, you, you get these diffraction effects. So yes, a fence could be used, but it's not a small fence. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like what we're talking about building on the border. <laughs> it's, 
going to be big, bigger than we could afford. We, we, we did not. We looked at it. and, and uh, Could it be smaller if you put a small shield around each antenna? Well, I, I, you, you're, you're probably right. There are, it, for example, if we hadn't had as much reduction in, in the side lobes looking at the ground, we could have maybe, instead of having that flat ground screen, we could have built up something that was more like, you know, I showed you the feed for the SRT that's, that's basically a, uh, you know, a pan. And so, you know, if you put, for example, the sub parabolic antennas where they deliberately build a rim around the side to make it, yes, to cut down the side lobes at low elevation, uh, at low angles, yes. It, you, you can, certainly improvements could be made. Um, we, we looked at a lot of different things like that, but um, and if somebody else, I mean, there is another group now in, um, Ta uh, not Tasmania, <laughs> uh, Mauritius. Uh, it's a little island down, and it has a big advantage over what we, we wanted very much to look at the Magellanic clouds to see if they had the same ratio of deuterium to hydrogen, but we can't because their elevation in the sky is too low. But go to the southern hemisphere, you can look at the Magellanic clouds, and it's a very interesting project to measure the D over H ratio, the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in those other objects. And there is a group hoping to do that, but as far as I know, they're still trying to get funds to, uh, to, to do it. But I'm sure they will at some point. Yes. Are there projects in development for doing radio astronomy from the far side of the moon? Uh, yes. Uh, there's actually uh, um, uh, many groups around the world that are saying, you know, we ought to sort of stake out the far side of the moon and make sure that it stays radio quiet uh, because there are other projects where things are being put into orbit that would, would go to the far side of the moon that might have transmitters and so on that might, might uh, make that area not as radio quiet. Um, I should tell you that in terms of, of, of what we've seen with this anomalously deep absorption at uh, a very, very high redshift, uh, it, there was a proposal from another group called DARE uh, which was designed just exactly that, to do the same experiment that we did on the far side of the moon. NASA is now discounting that because they say that you cannot logically justify having to go to the far side of the moon because of the frequency range. It's not low enough where um, you'd have to do that to really, the ionosphere is not a big issue. Uh, it's, the local interference is a bit of an issue, but so the, that particular project, which was quite expensive, has been dropped. But um, the people that are interested in that, um, they, they may be trying to do the same similar thing uh, with smaller satellites, maybe with, um, you know, I'm using, what do they call the small satellites now? The ones that everybody uses. Oh, come on. Uh, CubeSats, yes, thank you. That's what happens when you get up in years, you know, I just <laughs> bank out on things. CubeSats, yes, a CubeSat experiment to at least explore what you can do on the far side of the moon, and especially to go even lower in frequency, because there are also predictions, I didn't show it, for a, another absorption that might occur at even higher redshift, whose, whose nature and so on, I cannot explain why it's there, but it is part of, of a theory that involves dark matter that might so, and that 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 is currently under study, as I think, I, and probably will occur. And as you probably know, the um, Chinese have something right now that ha ha is going to. I'm not sure the current status. Is it actually at the far side or not? It is, but unfortunately, as far as I know, that that particular system does not have a very good receiving system on, on it. So I'm not terribly optimistic it's going to get any very exciting new results. But I might be wrong. Hopefully I'm wrong. But hopefully it'll get some exciting results. Okay. All right. Daniel? Okay. Um.
Thank you all for coming, I guess. Uh, uh, obviously, we'd like to see you all again. There are more talks. Um, and, I mean, there are groups that do this at MIT. There's MIT Haystack. Lincoln Labs does more active radar stuff. Um, and even on campus, there's Radio Society, there are a few labs that do millimeter wave, and if that's what you're interested in, those things are here. And that, I guess, hope to see you all tomorrow at uh, Mary Knapp's talk on basically, well, what some of you were asking about, space-based applications for radio astronomy. And if you're so, interested in hearing more about the MIT Radio Society and being on our email list, and you haven't signed up yet, I'm going to leave the book right here. So just be sure to sign up on your way up. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard to cover a lot of material with a lot of detail, I know. Yeah. It was good. I hope I... One of the big things is everything I think people enjoyed it. I don't know if I explained things a little better. It was wonderful, it was wonderful. I tried a Faraday cage in my first to get rid of the noise. I was looking at the interior and I was like, and it made the signals worse. It's happening again. Everything's an antenna. You don't think?